One slash two. This is episode two of the Mountains Project podcast with David McKinney. We kick it, talk about uh, all sorts of stuff, moto trips, sponsorship stuff, and uh, have a good time. Now, if you watched episode one, you saw my intro to that, and you understood, you you know that um, this is supposed to be a podcast I was going to kick off all fall, but uh, things are changing rapidly in the world of Roscoe, and uh, it is uh, about to get hectic, and I don't think I'm going to be able to do it as much as I thought. So. We recorded it, and you guys are going to get it anyways here on YouTube, so I hope you enjoy. Give it a like, a comment, and make sure you subscribe to the channel because, um, yeah, I got other stuff in the works, and I'm very, very excited about it. It's going to be absolute chaos, so I hope uh, hope I can keep up with it all, and I uh, hope I can create a bunch of fun stuff for you guys to enjoy because uh, it's go time, as I like to say. So thanks for watching, and uh, enjoy the conversation with me and uh, Kenny. Later. Ladies and gentlemen, here we are. I might do an intro by myself talking about this episode, or I'll just run it just like this. Welcome to the Mountains Project. This is episode one with the notorious David McKinney, who I somehow got Wait, on my well, show. You put me on episode one? Well, yeah. You're oh, going to be episode oh, no. one, and, and let me tell you why. Okay. Let me tell you why. Because I had some other guys lined up. Actually, I, I did a pilot episode by myself. That's like explaining the idea of this show. But then I had some other guys, <clears throat> Kyle Pulsifer, <clears throat> lined up because he's, you know, but he can't quit pouring concrete to save his ass. So we got David, who was going to be number two. So I was going to say, this sounds like I'm last resort, but yeah. I'll, I'll take it. You're not, dude. I'm hoping, that, I'm hoping that you will be a, a face that we see on this a lot. If you choose okay, to be goodness. good rebuttal, good rebuttal. We're either going to have 3000 episodes or three episodes of this show. So who really knows? <laughs> um, but anyways, David is the, uh, he's a snowmobiler. He's one of the most passionate snowmobilers. I know he likes to ride snowmobiles more than I do, I think. And, uh, yeah, he is sure. also my main guy at five Oh nine. He's the man behind a lot of the, uh, pretty much all of the media there. Um, a lot of the videos, he takes care of all the U.S. guys down here on the video side of things. And him and I have had some adventures. And uh, we just got done with our little moto trip. So before I just <laughs> tell David's story for him, we're going to get into it a little bit more. But, uh, yeah, David, what do you got for us, bro? I mean, where do you want me to start? I feel like I feel like a lot of people have heard the story and they know that by now. But mm -hmm. one thing I want to reiterate is... I do have an issue with how much I love snowmobiling. I shouldn't say it's an issue. I'm thankful that I'm still this level of obsessed with it because if I, if I wasn't, I would hate what I'm doing. Um, but you need to work on your level of obsession a little bit, Ross. Yeah. <laughs> I love you like a brother. Sometimes you complain to me about snowmobiling and anybody complaining to me about snowmobiling instantly gets on this bit of a shit list with me. So, <laughs> Heading into this winter, I want Stoke, like McKinney level of a 10-year-old watching snowflakes come down for the first time. That's where I'm at all the time. It is, dude. Well, previously you would get that out of me because I just guided for 60 days straight. And now I'm, I've become a little bit better. My relationship has changed with it. I get to ride for myself a little bit more. I'm, I'm still not matching you by any means because you like to go. Like we'll be done filming and you're like, all right, let's go. I want, let's go ride. Like also cause you're filming well, all day. So you're not yeah, really I was riding. Say, that's cause I, I stood there all day and watched you have fun. Yeah. <laughs> that's the part that people don't ever see. Like Phil Weibar, awesome filmer. Also, I, he probably can testify to that is we'll go into these killer zones and everybody's like, isn't it just the greatest thing ever riding with the best guys in the world and seeing all this terrain. I'm like, yeah, it is. But, by the time I'm done shooting it, it's all tracked out and we're on to the next spot. I don't ride it. Don't get me mm -hmm. wrong. It's beautiful. It's awesome being there. But, I mean, you guys destroy the crap out of it. And then I got to pick through the minefield and move on to the next spot. So, yeah, end of the day, I just kind of want to ride because I'm, like, got this adrenaline high from watching you guys. And I got to, you know, burn a little energy off. Yeah. Yeah, for the people who don't know how we operate in the backcountry, 
a lot of times it's like we have three days to like shoot a segment or it's like it's just full pin as many shots as you can get as many zones as you can hit it's so we don't really get that luxury of just like ripping stuff up for the heck of it like we're gonna shoot it because um we don't really work on the same budget as like maybe a company called red bull media house like we don't have like a month to shoot a segment um so if, we're, if you're watching this though red bull hit us up yeah we could use help. if anybody's Please. got that budget for some big films yo hit us up because we're all about it mm-hmm. <laughs> we would love to have that we'd love to be able to put something together on that level um of, you know in some far-fetched world but so it's very true and phil would agree with you i'm sure um I've been with Phil where he said, Ross, are you going to hit that? And I was like, I don't know. He's like, well, then you're going to hold the camera because I'm hitting that thing. Like, (laughs) so there's, there's something to be said about that of like being out there and not getting to ride. But then at the same time, filming isn't necessarily our definition of riding, right? We're trying to make things happen for camera and we're not just ripping with our boys. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not like a relaxed laid back day of just hanging out and giving high fives. There's high fives, but it's after you accomplish something that just took 15, 20 shots to get right. And uh, I don't know, dude. It's I get so many mixed emotions on it. I, I love it, but there's just times when you spend a whole day out there and nothing works out at all. You and I have done that a ton where everything's against you, whether it's the light, the snow, the terrain, everything. And those days get draining and very, very old. Yeah. Yeah. Because we get, you and I have four days to film six. If we're lucky a year, we didn't even do that this year. We literally didn't ride together this year. And I'm so sorry. It's okay. We'll always bring it up until we do ride together and film. <laughs> but, uh, but then, cause you want like, you, I want a six segment of me. You want a six segment. And then like, we just don't get it. And then, the BC boys get like three feet of pow in blue skies. And we're like, Ugh. like, obviously their, mm-hmm. their stuff was way better. I mean, the, they, they hit the, the weather lottery that year and we didn't the same can, it can, it can flip though. Like that can happen differently each year. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's the game we play in the snowmobile content world, but yeah, I like how we just kind of skip the whole intro thing and we just start complaining about stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just complain <laughs> about making videos. God, it's hard uh it's been a heck of a lot easier this past season with the youtube series that we launched at 509 because we can use that stuff that everybody threw away all that b and c grade footage if you will we can use it all the other funny cutaways the behind the scenes stuff we're not just trying to edit like a grade banger footage to a four minute long song um yeah. we're really able to cap capture who the guys are helmets off and that was a goal with that is like you guys are so underutilized as far as your personalities go like our whole roster is awesome dudes but everybody just knows them to some techno beat throwing down the backcountry and then on to the next segment which was cool had its time and place for sure but with the youtube era i mean ross you're you're a kind of a product of that that's what you've been chasing for a while and pushing we're able to now bring these guys personalities to the masses and you know the whole point of it is like people want to relate to them they want to hang out with them they want to meet them they want to go to a event like heydays or snow show and hang out and chat with the guys at autograph session like they they genuinely have a connection with them now Mm -hmm. and like i said all the guys have phenomenal personalities we just hadn't had a platform where we're able to bring that to the stage and now we do so it's been fun with everything i just said we didn't get to shoot an episode but thankfully we did some stuff this summer so guys were able to kind of see you helmets off but we need to carry that into this winter and knock it out of the park Mm -hmm. and i think this winter is going to be better on all fronts for you know every athlete every webisode will be better more used to it you know And like you guys are getting your stuff figured out as well. And now the audience knows what to look for. Like those like regular uploads of content. Yeah. We learned a lot from season (laughs) one. Um, It's a lot to manage still. It's tough. I'd love to get weekly videos out. Uh, It's just, man, you just gotta be full tilt. Like hats off to those guys that are uploading like twice a week. I know they got a pretty big team behind them, but 
geez, dude, it's like nonstop go, go, go capturing content. I'd, ha- mm-hmm. I'd have to like quit everything else I'm doing in the office to make that happen. Right. Yeah. It's, that's what people don't understand is the amount of time to like put good quality stuff together is just, it's, it's exponential when it goes from like just, you know, making your cuts to like actually doing a sick edit. It's exponentially more time. And yeah, I had somebody actually ask me, I did like a more, an Instagram post that was more edited, colored, like some cool camera angles and stuff. And somebody asked me how long it took. I was like, it was like a four hour, 60 second video I made for, for $0. I made it cause I was felt like I needed to make something cool to make sure I still had it, you know? So like the team has to be crazy and it's, or you just have to like work your, work your butt off, which is gnarly. And you have other things. Like I, I call you when I need gear. Like I, you know, you and I talk about way more than just like making videos. Um, yeah. so you do a lot more than just the media man there. Um, which is cool. You're also you know the, like probably the most about the gear because you're around us all winter and you're in it all winter as well. So you're right. knowledgeable on all fronts. The gear side's fun. I <laughs> grew up not knowing anything about gear. I was, I mean, I'm from, I'm from Minnesota originally. And, uh, shout out to the Midwest got, fans. Yeah. I just, I just bought what was ever warm because I mean, it was the nineties and you're wearing a choco jacket from the hardware store, like just trying to not freeze every bit of your extremities off. And since, you know, moving West and riding mountain sleds and technology advancing, like that part's been so interesting to me, learning all different materials, working with design team, the athletes, he, hearing their feedback and then implementing it into new gear. Like, it's not really even part of my job title. It just overlaps so well that I've slowly become obsessed with like the technology side of the gear and Mm -hmm. testing it and, you know, getting your feedback and then making sure it gets reiterated to the team and continuing to just amplify what we're producing. Yeah. I just, dude, I'm such a gearhead and you've seen me nerd out big time with, the t- the product team like once if I can get in there yeah. and see stuff I'm all about it and I want to know what's going on and like for me I learned about it when I was in like high school kind of I had this I had an outdoor teacher who was super into like he was like into the tech and what to look for and how to understand it and then I like that just spiraled my like my obsession for it and I'm the same way with everything it's like what is I I can spend hours like, I just go down the rabbit hole of gear right? Like doesn't even right. matter. Um, so I waste a lot of time, but I also am quite knowledgeable, which is nice. It's great with our relationship, but when I'm looking at parts for things that are not in the industry that make me money, I'm just <laughs> wasting time, you know, like I'm, I'm an expert on bike tires, but like, do I need to be? Not really. So right. it's, uh, I, I, it's fun. <clears throat> I feel like, I feel like guys overlook that part a lot too. Like once they land a sponsorship, it's one thing to be super heavy on the social front and push the brand. Like that's rad. I mean, that's, that's great. You're, you're marketing it, you're advertising it, you believe in it, but having the knowledge of the product to back it up, there's a lot of guys that I can confidently say couldn't tell. Actually, I could say 75% of the guys couldn't tell you the waterproof breathability of most of our gear out there. And the guys that do know are like, that's awesome. They, they, everybody should. And I think heading into the season, we're going to restructure a few things so that the whole team's kind of up to date on that. And I mean, partially that's us to blame, but also, um, it just goes that much further. Like they're taking in more information when they're riding like yourself, you're understanding why this is working in this condition, why this isn't, you know, what could be improved to make this outshine and, you know, these moist days versus the drier days. But, uh, yeah, I feel like a lot of guys overlook that stuff once they land a sponsorship. It's more just about, you know, I pushed it out here. Here's how many people saw it. It's more of an ad campaign than, you know, development side. Mm -hmm. And Young Bucks, you better be listening right now because it just (laughs) came out. Some info for you. The other thing, with that being said, it's like you get the gear and then the gear ends up on a 
a photo on your garage floor and it says, thanks for the gear. I'm like, why, why should I buy this? Get like, give me some sort of like value in why this product is good or why should I use this? Or like, I don't care. Like, I don't care that they gave you that for free. That doesn't make me want to go buy it. I want to know why you choose to use it. Why should I go buy it? Like what, what features does it have? What benefits? Like, yeah. Even, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be brand specific or, or like the piece of gear specifically. It can be also like tied into the brand, right? Like right. I resonate very well with 509, like the brand and Roscoe kind of like work together very well of like what the brand stands for and what Roscoe stands for. So that's my little tangent on what you just hinted at. <laughs> no, but I, like, I appreciate all forms of people shouting it out. Like, right. For sure. I get the garage thing. People are stoked, but, uh, there's things that stand out like guys like Ben Burke, for example, he's one of our ambassadors out of the Tahoe area. And every year he's, he's one of those material geeks. He nerds out over material and all tech stuff. Every year he gets his stuff. He either does a full, you know, when you max out your stories and you can't add any more stories, Yeah. he gets to that point or he goes on live, but does like full breakdowns of what he picked out this year. Why? like down to battery length on ignite stuff, like, like in depth, but to that point where it's not like, all right, this guy's just rambling. Like he's genuinely knowledgeable. And he talks about different scenarios that he put it through, you know, the previous season and why he ordered it again or why you need this in your pack. And that's awesome. I mean, that's, that's what Mm -hmm. it's all about. It's, it's, it's one thing when it looks sick and everything, but knowing why or understanding why it works so well, you know, just, means that much more right yeah and i think the thing to be said about that is everybody can take the garage photo and everybody is taking the garage photo but not everybody's um creating the valuable content like ben for example so like differentiate yourself figure out a way to do something that's going to make put you on the on the radar of you know the people that are calling the shots if you're trying to get you know some support for yourself but if I'm looking directly at myself, it looks kind of weird too. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to, I'm going to subconsciously look to you when I talk as yeah. long as it looks natural. It looks fine. Okay. I'm going to leave, I'm I'm gonna gonna leave that in there too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to lead I, off. I had some, I had one more thing I was going to say on that topic that you were. I don't want this podcast to be too serious, but it's so easy to get serious. Yeah. We'll, we'll trail off after we wrap up this. Um, Oh, and that's the last thing I want to we, end off on this. After we teach the youngins some lessons. Yeah. And one last thing to, to go off of there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Jumping back in three, two, one. Um, yeah, but on the content creation side and thinking outside the box, I get a lot of people asking like, you know, should I get a photographer? I can't get high res images, all this stuff, which is, which is fine now with stories and live, there's so many day-to-day things you could do to think outside the box. Like that raw content, it actually does really, really well right now. So even if you're just posting on your story, but put yourself in it, like go selfie cam. I think a lot of people are, you know, kind of uh, shy or reserved when it comes to chatting on camera, Mm -hmm. but put in a face to who you are while chatting about the gear. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah, put in a face. <laughs> Hold on. Is that your shutter closing? <laughs> okay, we beat that topic. I don't know if we want to figure out how to wrap that up or not. Kind of lost our flow there. Anyways, Sorry. we had a we had a technical issue. Create good content. That's the thing. Think outside the box. Think outside That's the box. Do start. something. Watch some YouTube videos. You can do it with a GoPro and a phone. And you don't need fancy stuff. Start mm-hmm. simple. Work on the skills before the gear. I shot the first full season of the BBA vlog on an eight hundred dollar camera. Yeah, with one lens. Now you can shoot it on an iPhone. Now I and I could have shot it on an iPhone easier, probably. Yeah, yeah. So, um, ah, but you yeah. want to talk about dirt bikes, dude? I kind of do. <laughs> hey, it's getting expensive. Or I mean, it's going to get more expensive because I'm. They're so damn fun. And we need new bikes, yeah. And we need new, need new bikes. And uh, we had a hell of a time. We yeah. 
we did our little extravaganza that uh, hopefully some of you guys have seen. And if you haven't seen it, go go check it out on the Five Hundred Nine YouTube channel. Um, obviously a lot of the five a lot of the Five Hundred Nine like core fans aren't um necessarily dirt bike fans. I don't know. I I always am like, why doesn't other sports hit so hard? It's like if I'm I love all action sports. Like you can show me surfing, and I'm like, dude, this is so sick. I respect these guys so much, but like it's crazy to watch the winter and then this, like the tail off of like interaction through the summer. Yeah. So we're trying and it's a slow process, but it was fun to do this first moto trip. And I, hopefully we can do it again next year. Yeah. hundred percent. For those who don't have any idea what we're talking about, Ross and I beginning of June, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Beginning of June got in the truck, rented a camper, threw our dirt bikes in the back and pretty much everything but the kitchen sink went with us. We were on the road for like 12 days, I want to say. And we made a bunch of stops along the way and started capturing some single track stuff just to keep the channel going in the summer, promote that we have an off-road side of 509. Um, we're getting into some really cool stuff. We got awesome gear on that side. It's just a, a new market for us. But uh, yeah, we were just gypsies with motorcycles for two, almost two weeks straight. Yeah, it was, uh, by the time we did silver, the hard enduro, uh, sticks and stones, it was 16 days for me. Oh so, my gosh. Yeah, I'm it was, sorry. A, it was I'm two sorry weeks. I drug you away from home that long. <laughs> Dude, it was so fun. We had so much it's fun. It's definitely the highlight of my summer. It's probably one of the most fun things I've done in the summer for a while. Yeah. I would say so I for me too. confidently say that. Yeah. yeah. The craziest part about it is like we were sleeping four feet from each other for that long. And the trip was going to go one of two ways. We were going to become best friends by the end of it, or we were going to want to slit each other's throats. Yeah. And thankfully there was a couple moments of tension here and there. Yeah. We only went to bed mad at each other <laughs> one night. <laughs> And it kind of it kind of scarred me, dude. I was like, because I'm trying to. I actually slept outside most nights, and thank God. So I was trying to go in and out of the camper, like getting my outside sleeping set up. And David's like, the bugs are gonna get in here. He was losing his mind over bugs, and I was just trying to get my bed set up. And yeah, we didn't exchange okay. any words like "I hate you" or "You're a dick," but mm -hmm. we did. It, there was some. Uh, it was kind of passive aggressive there towards the end. There was some tension. There was some tension for sure. Well, dude, so I grew up in northern Minnesota where if you look out the window wrong, there's mosquitoes coming in the house. And it's like just stuck in my brain that it's nighttime. If the door's cracked, there's lights on, there's mosquitoes flying in. They're and coming. Ross They're just, coming yeah, for you. Yeah. Granted, they weren't mosquitoes. They were still bugs. They were like gnats or moths. Yeah. But Ross would grab something, and every time you'd walk out, you would just leave the door open. And I was, I'm like, I, I'm the one stuck in here all night. You're just sitting outside to the elements because you want to be with the bugs. Doesn't mean I want to be with the <laughs> bugs. And you got kind of pissed at me, and I felt yeah. bad. And I woke up the next morning and addressed it right away. And we, like big boys, you know, we talked about our feelings. Yeah. <laughs> then we went yeah. and rode motorcycles. Yeah, yeah, so. Jeez, yeah, I can't even remember everything that happened on that trip. We, uh, do you want to dive into some of the behind the scenes on it that didn't make the cut? Yeah, I mean, like, it was just, well, we had really no game we, plan. We did a little bit of partying. <laughs> yeah, we had a good time. And that was literally the first time we had been out in the world, like, post, like, the, the whole last year, right? So we, you and I hadn't, like, we hadn't went and got drinks. We hadn't seen a live band, none of it. And we're just like Park City's ripping. We're like, yeah, we're going to do it all. We're going to go down, down Park City one night. It was, and, um, but we didn't really have a plan. So we ended up just finding ourselves with a truck trailer and camper, like trying to figure out where to park, where to sleep, how to get here, do all this stuff. Oh my God. But dude, it was, it was fun and it was good. Like we, it was fun to do that. Because so often we do when we are on those trips, the nice part about it was we did have time. We had yeah, yeah. 14 days to hit these locations. So we had travel days so we could, you know, we could go hang out in Park City. We didn't have to like boom, 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 where typically we're on for 
we're shooting every single day and it's like shot list. So that yeah. was, that was really fun. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Park city. Great town. If anybody's <laughs> from park city. Wow. We, uh, we definitely made it to bar close like two nights in a row there yeah. on some down days, but it was well, well deserved. We had been riding for like four days straight. I broke my thumb. So a little liquid to numb it and, uh, got it out of our system. And then we yep. carried on and, and continued to kick butt. But, uh, yeah. you know, just a little, little hiccup there. We had to kind of get the post COVID bars are open. Bands are playing out of our system and yep. carry on. Yep. It was fun. And yeah. you know, that town is just like, it was, it's warm and you're outside walking around. You can walk everywhere. It's super yeah, fun. It's a good time. It's the kind of, uh, I love those kind of like towns, um, kind of like resort style. I don't love the resort pricing and like some of the, <laughs> there's parts of them that I love kind of being from like, you know, Bend, Oregon is turning, is kind of like that. It has that little vibe. It's not like full resorty, but it, it is turned into a resort city style and there's sure. special things about it, but then there's lots of negatives as well with the madness that comes um to it. But yeah, we rode a lot of dirt, but like I rode more dirt bikes. I in that those 14 days than I've ridden in a long time. Like we were riding a shit ton. And I'm not a dirt biker at all. Not even the slightest. Like didn't grow up on them. My dad was like, that's where I drew the line. I was already trying to run into trees on a snowmobile and they thought mm -hmm. the summer was the time I could pump the brakes and not kill myself. So yeah. I'm still trying to figure these things out. And uh, then we were thrown into like nine days of riding them. So I still haven't really figured it out, but I definitely learned a lot on that trip. Yeah, definitely got better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank God, too. Oh, that would have <laughs> really been a well, bummer if I got if, worse. If you get worse, you just know, you just, ah, I'm selling this thing, and this is not yeah, what it's going to be. Yeah, this isn't for me. This is not my sport. <laughs> know your weaknesses. Dude, that's actually the same thing for me, is mom would, she knew that if I got on a motorcycle, I would be balls to the wall, which she was right. Mm -hmm. So she just was like, no. So I yeah. just was like, well, I'm going hard on the sled. And, uh, now I'm a grown adult and I can make my own decisions and I want to ride a dirt bike. <laughs> I also, I also choose to ride it in, you know, still dangerous. Obviously everything I do is dangerous, but I choose to like, not, I'm not going to go race moto. I'll go like race hard enduro, which is a little bit slower and, but still dangerous. I mean, anyway, you cut it. So, so speaking of hard enduro, Bruh. how would you explain the Silver Mountain Extreme Enduro Challenge. Dude, it was, I would say it was the most fun I've had in a long time because I'm, A, I'm so competitive. I think I love racing and I never really got to do it growing up. Um, So like to go compete and race and just ride hard and like an awesome track, I thought the, um, I guess, call it amateur day the amateur track was like awesome thought it was super fun it was technical you still got to ride it wasn't so hard that you couldn't go whereas right. like pro day was gnarly there was some shit in there um yeah but dude and it's just like so many people there's 500 people which is crazy you just don't see that right like there's no race like that in the states that's that big it's the biggest in north yeah. america so it felt like almost European to me, um, which was cool. I, uh, be, I, I guess I'm competitive. I think I figured that out in that race. Um, yeah. I think what we're overlooking too is that every single person out there, those 500 riders, were either on a 250 or a 300. And Ross yes. and I underskilled on 150s. Thankfully, 150 XCWs, so wide ratio, first to third, you know, softer suspension set up, so, a, you know, an enduro bike, but right. 150 cc two stroke. So, like, our first through third is nothing like a first through third on a 300. Like, it doesn't have that bottom end torque. It rings out way faster. I'm, like, constantly in a fine line between lugging it and power bands. There's no in between. Yep. So, that in its own kicked my ass like just oh, trying sure. to learn trying to get comfortable on a bike in all these scenarios but then like constantly doing clutch work so 
what I'm getting at is lap one, I was like, okay, I think I'm a competitive person. When lap two came around, I blacked out, don't remember a single thing about it, and just kept going. All I remember is, like, I just got to get as far as I can get. And other than that, I mean, I was riding the loosest I've ever ridden. I'm going over, like, boulders that normally I'd be, like, kind of tiptoeing through. I'm, like, third gear wicks, the back end's all over the place, and I'm just in the zone. And I still didn't finish the flipping race. (laughs) Well, you did. That's the the other thing about it is you started so many rows back. Yeah. Too like you gotta bat, you gotta push through all the the bottlenecks too, which is unfortunate. Um, and you know what's funny is the tr- the track the course changes so much once two hundred guys go through it. Oh yeah, like it yeah. is insane. I went through one section the first time, and it was only flagging. It was flagging and bushes. There was no trail. And second lap I went through, yeah. I was like, oh, here's the trail. They just made it over the last twenty five minutes. Um, right. But. I'll be honest. Um, I didn't ride like necessarily hard enduro, like hard stuff on my moto before. Like I rode some stuff, but and I, everybody's like, "You gotta have the three hundred. Got the three hundred is the king." And I was like, "Yeah, I okay, like sure." The one fifty goes as fa- it's fast and fun and light and all everything. Well, I figured out where the three hundred is the king, and it's in that those holes and yeah. creeks. In that's in the gnar. It just has that lug ability where you can like get over stuff you know um because that's the thing is the 150 won't lug so you're like it won't lug it won't spin the tire and then you let a little more clutch out and you spin it and then it just rips through and it It breaks loose and you dig yourself a hole and so yeah next year if i can figure out how to find myself a 300 and the money to buy one i will uh be back with vengeance on a 300 looking to steal souls what you're being so humble about is how many people were in B class? Mm, I don't know how many total there were. I know I started in row seven and I finished six at, across the line. So I passed like 65 at, yeah. guys. Just say at a bare minimum, a hundred guys. Yeah. Right. Comfortably. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think there was one 150 in that class. Cause I wasn't in B. <laughs> <laughs> so you and the only other 150 i saw was like a 15 year old girl racing women's and she yeah. was a ripper she was a so you rider. finished six in b on a 150 i mean yeah dude you were kicking ass you were on one you i was get on a 300 a you get a 300 between your legs i think you're gonna be winning b class next year i'm going race I'm, a i'm racing a i i because of the whole like being able to go race pro day um yeah that's the problem is because there's honestly in that race there's a lot of guys in a that should aren't necessarily a riders because if you race a you get to qualify for pro and you have a better shot of qualifying in front so you can go race the hard course why half of these guys actually want to go race the hard course is beyond me because i went and got in the hard course and you sit in a creek for 45 minutes to an hour if you're not up front so i don't really understand why these i think it's just like yeah, I raced against the pros. It's like, dude, you sat in a right. creek all day. Yeah. So that's for me. Like, I'm out there to ride, but I do think, yeah, next year I need to go. Because I, I was being told by some other guys I should have raced day, which I guess I should have. <laughs> but uh, Well, you get a 300 yeah. race A, I'll get a 300 race B. Deal. Boom. Yeah, deal. Okay. No You're going to win. You'll win B, bro. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'd just be happy to finish the race. I'm a snowmobiler. I'm, I enjoy anything with a set of handlebars. That's the thing. That's where we differ. So you have the love for snowmobiling at, at this level. My love for snowmobile, mountain bike, moto, anything in the like spectrum is all at that level. So it's like, I just don't, it feels like, so everything doesn't hit as hard. You know, I always tell people like, yeah. yo, Yo, if I grew up on the if I grew up on in Hawaii, I'd be a pro surfer. It's probably bullshit, right. but like, I can I find the love for it the same way. If that makes sense. This yeah, this year for sure I've enjoyed. I I've never not enjoyed riding my dirt bike. It's just it's new to me. I've enjoyed that aspect more than anything because you get to a certain point in sledding, 
at least what I'm doing because it's my job where right. to progress anymore, I'm going to have to start like hucking my body and risking injury, which I, I can only do to a certain extent because it's my job. Right. If I'm out, I'm screwed. Right. So like, I'm kind of like, I mean, I have to toot my own horn. I've kind of like plateaued on sledding of where I can push it without getting like fully upside down constantly and doing stuff like that. But bikes, it's like taking a step back 10 years on sleds. And you're at that point where every single time you go out, you're learning something new and you're getting that adrenaline high, like doing something you've never done before. And it can be super mundane as like, oh, I successfully went from third to second at the right point in this hill climb and made it. Right. And, you know, I haven't had that in a sled for, for years. I, I still, sleds are superior to me and they still get that adrenaline high, but this year more than ever, like I've enjoyed riding my bike, but the back of my mind is just a placeholder. It's still yeah. just a placeholder for soul building. And while I'm out there, I'm like looking at terrain thinking, man, this would become, this would be super fun to come back to this winter and ride. It's just kind of another excuse to get into the mountains in the summer months while, you know, wait for old man winter to come around. Yeah. And it keeps you sharp too. But that beginner, that like beginner progression is so real. And I think right. anybody can relate to it is like when you are, I wouldn't say like, for me, it's not like the beginner beginner because there's like a point of like figuring out how to even do the basics, but it's like right after yeah. you get like the basics dialed and then you're just like getting faster, stronger, like more comfortable. Like you're just, everything's clicking. That's when it's so much fun. And that's where like, that's what moto feels like. That's what mountain bike still feels like a little bit to me. I feel like on the mountain bike, I'm kind of plateauing. Um, without You're like spreading on the mountain bike. shit. So yeah, I feel, uh, I I feel you. Your your mountain biking is like where I'm at on my sledding between actual day job and and sledding for fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely my buddy Carson Storch. Yeah, he has a an airbag at his house, and he's like, dude, you got to come hit the bag. So I'm like. I might go hit the bag. But the thing is, here's the thing. Cause we hit, remember when we hit the bag a few years ago, right? His yeah. is like quite a bit bigger, but the thing is with his is he has three shipping containers stacked on top of each other. And then a roll in that's like a, it's a piece of plywood wide. So it's, that's the roll in three shipping containers tall. And the knuckle on it is so tight that you have to bunny hop into it. Oh, no. and there's no, no so rail. You're committed. You're yeah. committed. Yeah, there's no exit. Um, so literally, that's the scariest part. Is like, is it just like butted up plywood? It's not like a roll in at all. No. It's just like yeah, it's so literally like it. an angle. So and you'd like frame. You'd frame out if you tried to roll into it. Yeah, you'd frame out yeah. and die. Yeah. And oh. Yeah. So once you're going, you're going. You're going. <laughs> yeah, I will. Uh, no, I will hard pass. Hard yeah, pass. hard hard pass. That's pretty, all you, Roscoe. Pretty scary. Maybe someday we'll see. Yeah. But uh um God, we were just talking about the beginning, like beginners kind of progression. And we yeah, you know, we've alluded to it a little bit. Like the first time you and I really met was at BBA. <laughs> and the funny part was is when we rode, like that was not good snow. It was bad snow conditions. And I remember a couple things. A you were like figuring out how to be a mountain rider. You had just got your job. How many years mm -hmm. ago was this too? Is this like five years ago now? Six? Oh man. I think that was winter of 15. So it'll be seven this winter. Wow. Yeah. Dang. So, and I was like young Roscoe. I was still trying to get yeah. my part in 509. Yeah. Because every year it was like, you can have like, we'll put you in with Chris a little bit, or like you can we'll put you in with Sane a little bit. Like I want my segment so bad. And I remember I smoked a tree. I got clotheslined off a tree. You remember that shot? Yeah. Dude. Yeah. I got it on my cell phone of all things. <laughs> uh, but on my uh, iPhone five or something. Yeah. That's where the inception kind of started with you and I of, you know, shooting there. And then we shot again in Colorado and then, well, let's. I think you need to unwrap that a little bit on how painful that trip was for me. I'm at twelve thousand feet, fresh out of Minnesota. 
on an absolutely royally clapped out Skidoo XM, like 4,500 miles on it. Yeah. Zero maintenance. The suspension's blown. It's down like 1,500 RPM. And that was your first impression, I think. That was it. Like, we barely chatted the night before. It was just getting the truck. I met you guys there, unloaded. And here's your filmer. <laughs> <laughs> and we're trying to guide at the same time. So it's like, I, we really didn't have much, like, energy to give you in the morning. Because we got, like, six guests that have to be taken care of as well. Yeah. So it was like, Thank oh. God things improved. We're out here. Oh, dude. You've, yeah. You're certified shredder, shred lord now. Can you imagine if it didn't click? I don't think you'd have a job. I don't either. <laughs> I would. I would have understood too. You would have been, I would have been like, like I would have been like, yeah, I suck. It's fine. it's fine, and I get, I get it. What was the like but, hardest? I mean, because it all happened fast, right? Like you becoming yeah. the man, the film dude in the U.S. for five hundred nine. Yeah, right? it happened real fast, like in a matter of a couple months. Yeah. Which is yeah. like, how did that, like, how did you like f handle it early on? It was, I mean, it was a good time for what I had going on in life. Like I was fairly fresh out of college and, uh, I was just doing like freelance work back in Minnesota, doing stuff in the snow cross circuit, doing kind of random things here and there and trying to save money for camera equipment and flipping snowmobiles. I was doing that a lot, like buying sleds and fixing them up except for my own and then selling them. And, uh, I was kind of a bit of a free bird at the time. So it worked out great. Like I could have been better timing. I was wide open that winter. I didn't really have anything major planned besides some snow cross stuff. And it was just impeccable timing. Honestly, I dropped everything else I had going on and headed West and slowly transitioned into it. But I lived in Dave McClure's basement in Swan Valley, Idaho that, that winter, yeah, I remember that. So that was cool. I was right down the road from Alpine, Wyoming, and I, I rode there every single day. Even I had days off, I'd go hang out with Dan um, at Next Level and ride with him, or I'd go ride with Sane or somebody and just kind of progress. That, that was my goal out of that was, okay, we got film days, but now nobody can film for five days because, you know, they're guiding or something. Because at the time, we had Dan Adams on the team. So Dan was super kind and would – let me tag along on these clinics. And I bet I went along for shit, probably 10 of his clinics, just kind of shadowing it and taking notes and learning things. And um, yeah, so throughout that season, it was all rapid pace, but I was also trying to like rapidly learn how to ride better and taking the initiative on those days off to go out and whether it was just some random guys from the area and go ride with them that day, or if it was with Dan or Sane and, taken any sort of knowledge I could on how to get better at doing this. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was an awesome first season and thank God I figured it out because I have been drugged through some serious stuff since then. Yeah, that you have, you have been through the ringer for sure. But yeah, you the, know, the big, go, go ahead. ahead. No, you go ahead. No, you go. <laughs> the, the, big, <laughs> the biggest takeaway I've had as I've progressed and chatted with people that are now trying to progress their riding is so many people get scared or they have that their first time experience adrenaline. There's a lot of people that haven't really had many adrenaline highs yeah. and it scares the shit out of them. But I look back and remember how many times, like there's a handful of times I can remember clearly the scenario, everything where it was like heart beating out of my chest thinking, I cannot do this. I'm going to total the snowmobile. I'm going to get pinned in a tree, whatever it may be. And it clicked and you rode the line out or whatever it may be. And then after you do that once, you reassess that terrain completely after that. You're like, I've done this. I've been through that. I can do this. I've had that terrifying heartbeat out of chest moment in this scenario. I can now do it in a different scenario. And like telling people that, that if you get that terrified, that's good to an extent, you know, harness that and learn from that, mm. but don't let it discourage you. Yeah, dude, that's super, like, that's so beneficial being, learning how to get comfortable being uncomfortable in those situations. Mm -hmm. 
when it comes yeah, to riding. Yeah, harnessing adrenaline. Yeah, and dude, that's like I have those. I have those with Brant that I still remember of like 18 years old. Like following yeah. Chris, he's like, follow me, and I'm like, oh my god, like all I own in my entire like my entire life savings is in the snowmobile. And like, him, yeah. he's just like, you're going dude. And <laughs> that was always my rule with him is if he goes, I go. So like I would chase him, I'll chase him anywhere. And you know, that that's what you got to do to become a really good rider really fast. But something else that you were talking about before we really started talking about riding was like how the kind of opportunity happened for you. And I've been on, I feel like I kind of did the same thing with like in my career is like I saw opportunity and I took it and then I did whatever I had, whatever I could to like really harness it and leverage it. But I've been on the other side of it now seeing of a position where like people are kind of getting opportunities. And I think it's like, they don't take them for all they're worth. Like you took it for what it was worth. Like you moved in with McKe like McClure and like put yourself in the situation and went and rode every single day and filmed everything you possibly could and worked on the craft. Like you went above and beyond trying to like really earn your spot and your role to become this creator and rider that you are today. And I don't see that in a lot of people. And it honestly bones me out when I see the opportunity for someone and then I don't see them execute on it. Yeah. And, it's interesting topic. Um, just in the last 24 hours, I've had a few messages come through of people asking, like, how did you get to where you are? You know, what, what type of advice do you have? And, and so on, which I respect. I'll answer those every single time. Mm -hmm. But then I pull myself away and think, I never sent a message like that. I never did anything like that. And then it, I was just kind of there eventually. Like you were, I was just active, persistent in the industry, doing whatever I could to be visible in the industry, whether it was at events, it was at races, whatever it was. And I slowly had just kind of become like, oh, this guy's here again, right? And it wasn't mm -hmm. like from messaging and asking people where to be and when, it was just being there and physically being there. And eventually people were like, oh, this is cool. I saw what you posted, I saw this. And then, you know, just kind of started networking that way. But I haven't in a long time seen a guy that I've been like, oh, this dude, I've seen his stuff all over social. I've met you like 10 times at this event. I've seen you at this race. Like I haven't seen somebody that's taken the initiative to just go. I don't really mm -hmm. know how else to explain that. But like just being active in the industry they want to be, be in rather than asking people how to do it or how to get there and what steps they should take. It's like just doing it and like if you're that passionate about it you kind of let that obsession take over and be wherever you can be to make yourself relevant in that industry yeah I don't, it's tough to explain it's it, just it, it really is like i know what you're t and i know exactly what you're talking about of the like you gotta be there and you gotta like but you can't you can't want it too bad right and there goes his camera <laughs> But like, well, he, well, David's talking. getting, well, David's getting his camera back together. The thing is you can't want it too bad because Pete, like at, at events, ex, let's just use like trade shows, for example, like people have agendas and like work to do. So you can't just like be like buzzing in everybody's ear. And then they're like, they dismiss you. So it's this balance of like knowing when you can like enter and be socially, it's really tricky for sure. And it's hard to explain, but, um, yeah, I think, you know, you like you were just in the process the whole time and you're passionate about it. And the other thing is, too, with like you, like your you and I have a friendship, right? Like way beyond our work stuff. Half the time you're calling me and it doesn't even involve work or or you'll call me and I'm on a conference call in the office with like 14 <laughs> people. So I never know how to answer the phone. Like, <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. Or some FaceTime and I'm in a meeting. They're like, hey, we're we're talking about uh maybe some gear stuff. We like your input. And I'm like, oh shit. Um I actually do really enjoy those, so don't you should keep doing no, that because no. it's fun. Yeah, I planned on it. I planned on it. Um But uh yeah, I don't really know how to answer that. It's just I, I think part of it too was social media was really fresh at the time. Yeah. 
Like when I was hitting it hard, it was like 2011 through 14 ish. Like before I started doing like subcontract 509 stuff. And so you kind of had to be at the events. Right. People like the big OEMs like Polaris, Articat, whatever, Skidoo, they all had social media accounts, but not many of your smaller brands did. Not many athletes did. So you kind of had to physically be there. So it's kind of hard for me to answer that question to a lot of these kids that are 18 to 21 because their generation is there's, there's that gap now. Like I'm mm-hmm. not that old, but I'm, I'm at the point where there's definitely a generation gap on how people tackle meeting new people or putting their name out there. Um, so it's a tough thing to answer for sure. I, I definitely was at that end of that era where things were kind of old school in the beginning of the whole social era. I was right in that transition period where I still had to physically be present at events, make a good impression with somebody, get your name out there. But, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's ever changing. So there's definitely some old school methods that can carry through to today, but Mm -hmm. things are changing. Ultimately you still got to like, when it comes down to brass tacks, you still got to be able to have the meeting and talk and the face to face, because like, that's where the value really is going to like, when it comes to like working with somebody on, on something, you know, but, uh, dude, it's so, it's funny because I remember I remember this really well because it was right before I was still, I was working in Colorado and I was, um, I was working for Chris and it was the summertime. So I was off. I was working for my dad doing excavation. I was driving a dump truck all day. I I did like 70 loads a day. I just back and forth dump truck. And I remember like, I was like checking my phone and Chris Brandt 211. This was like early Instagram, Chris Brandt 211 creates an Instagram account following me following like sane sane was working with us at the time following Polaris climb like all the all of his sponsors Fox everybody right and I'm like I'm like Chris did you just make an Instagram account and he's like no I'm like well dude somebody just made an Instagram account pretending to be you and so I'm like well I'm gonna I'm like report it and whatever like 15 minutes later I get a text from Phil Wybar and he's like, no, I made Brant that account because <laughs> Phil was doing a lot of the creative at the time for Chris. So Brant didn't even make his own Instagram account back in the day. Phil made it right. for him. And he was like, Chris was killing it on Facebook. But Chris is old, yeah. dude. He was Facebook yeah, king. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I, dude, I remember him sitting at the table. He's like, man, Instagram's dumb. Cut four years later. And I was like, Facebook's dumb. Like, he's yeah. so funny. But that's the point. I mean, it's just ever changing. So I, I don't even know if I can give you solid advice nowadays. No, just, dude. Yeah. Kind of moral story. Just do it. Like if that's what you're passionate about to the point of where you're asking people, like, how do I get in this industry or how do I make this a career? Like just keep chasing it. And maybe honestly, maybe don't ask so many questions and just put your own twist on it and run with it. And, you know, put yourself in front of those those like-minded individuals and make a good impression and and keep charging. Yeah. And I think it is a good idea that if this podcast goes for more than three episodes, that we get together again and do a full deep dive of this, because I think it's a question that gets asked a lot. It's kind of exhausting on our end because we can, you and I can think about a of about a million ways to do it and, and cut the apple, right? Like we could come up with all these plans and like, Oh, you could do this and this and then do this and that and partner with them. And like, it's just, this is my life, right? Like this is goes in my head all the time. There's so many ways to do it. Like David just said, just do something. So hopefully we'll get on later and we can really dissect that. Cause that could be an hour by itself of, yeah, of content for you guys. And I know there's a lot of people out there that are interested in like that whole, that whole thing, but dude, it's heydays. And like, Three weeks, right? Oh my god! Hopefully, the long overdue heyday. Long oh, overdue. Dude. I'm so excited. I'm excited to see you in your next like right, habitat. With it's all like it's parents. like it's like right about right about there. That's heydays, dude. That's a spot. If Good old uh, North Branch, Minnesota. One yeah. Of the a, if you don't know about heydays um, and you're a snowmobiler, you're living under a rock and it's worth going once. 
like if you're not in the industry and you live out of state and it's not in your backyard, it's worth going at least one time just to see how crazy it is because it is huge. And B, and, if you just listen to us, B, if you just listen to us ramble about getting yourself out there and you want to work in the industry, you should be going to Heydays because that's a phenomenal spot to network. Yeah, very true. But enough on that topic. Yeah. Dude, there's always some sort of like com- new company mm-hmm. at Heydays that I'm like, what are you making? Or like, what's going yeah. on here? Um, it's so a place it is, to be. It is a place to be. Get a lot of eyes. Um, dude, it's so fun because we get to see so many people that we never see throughout the winter. Yeah. And yeah. it's a little bit more relaxed. It's early, it's still like summertime. We're still, you know, in summer mode a little bit. We're getting excited, and uh, it's really, really good time. So I'm what's excited. On, about it. What's on your heydays this year? I mean, you had a, you had a big season. You got an OEM um, sponsorship, which is yeah, awesome, yeah. dude. Yes, I told you, you congrats many a times, but that you have. Um, yeah. What's what's your heydays looking like now with an OEM backing you? I still, we still haven't had the meeting yet. Um, oh, I don't know. Gun, I sorry. mean, I don't know exactly like my day in and day out. Obviously I get there and I've got stuff to do um, with them, but I'm not sure what that entails. I think there'll be some like fun content around links. Obviously we're the new brand. We're stoked on it right. and we're going to be pushing hard. The interesting thing about it though, is we're really like building brand awareness at this point because you yeah. can't buy the links. The links is already, our orders are done. We are snow check only or spring check only for um, this last year. So it's like, you guys can't go get one in the fall unless somebody bails on an order and you somehow like manage to figure out how to get one after that. So it's really like building brand awareness. What is links for the future, which is fun because I love that kind of stuff. Like we get to like, hopefully do some cool stuff around it. Um, And then obviously like try to get people to maybe buy the following year because we're not going anywhere. Um, so that's a little bit different, you know, it's like, we're not trying to just like directly get people to buy sleds this fall, but there's a lot of yeah. the industry's going that way more and more. So, um, but it'll be fun to create some stuff, um, around that. I'm not sure what they have in, in mind or what they want me to do. I, they do, they did re, they did have told me they want me to do some content there. So, which I'll be ripping around and making content. So, um, as you guys are seeing this, this is like the first start of hopefully the content train going into the winter that will hopefully never stop. So, but it's fun. I mean, like, and then when we hang out with you guys, five Oh nine, we're going to be kicking it, doing some stuff. Heck sure. yeah, I'm, I'm pumped. I'm pumped. It's just one big happy gathering of like-minded people. <clears throat> yeah. And it's, I mean, it's a party. It's like the one place that the whole industry at one point in those 48 hours cuts loose and, lets their hair down and relaxes and you haven't seen mm-hmm. everybody for, you know, five, six months. And then you all get back together. Well, shit this year, we haven't seen everybody for two years by the time we right. all get back together. Uh, granted, a lot of us overlap in the winter, but there's so many guys at different aftermarkets, different OEMs, whatever, different athletes that it's like the one time a year you could for sure say, yeah, I got to see that person this year. So I'm so pumped for it. I'm always pumped, but this year more so than ever. Yep. Also, we do this little thing called the scavenger hunt when we drive there. So Phil, go Phil Chadwick, event coordinator at 509. He and I drive Legend. our happy asses 19 <laughs> hours across the country pulling this 509 trailer. And we head right up I-90, down through Fargo and right into North Branch. But we usually pack like a thousand bucks worth of 509 gear and leave it on the side of the highway wherever at a Taco Bell drive through wherever, and post it on our stories, and you guys all have a chance to grab it. But this year, I already – this is crazy, Ross. I already packed the scavenger hunt stuff, like, Whoa, a month in advance. Dude. Yeah. But we got, like, full outerwear sets, like, full Dang. gear sets that we're just going to leave along the way. So I'm pumped to do that because it's just fun to give back the industry like that and see people – claim it and then they message us that they found it and they're like they're kicking off their season on a high note like mm-hmm. they're so stoked maybe they're on their way to heydays too and they just got a free jacket like that's so fun to to see people just stoked um getting some gear to just kick off their winter yeah dude i can't believe how successful it is and how fast people find it oh i know yeah it's cool it's just 
kind of as the brand grows, so is the fan base. But there's yeah. last two years in a row before we even got into Fargo, there's been like 15 people like on the hunt for us. Like waiting so we for finally, the truck to roll yeah, in. Yeah, we finally last year just said, hey, we're going to stop at this gas station. We need fuel. And like last time we were there, there was like 20 people there. And they cleared us out of all of our stuff. And we had nothing else left after that for the scavenger hunt. Dude, you guys in Fargo need to cut it. You need to chill. That's ruining the, the scavenger the, hunt by waiting for the, the, the those, lineup. Those are the fans, it says, man. It says, welcome to Fargo. And there's like 40 people like... <laughs> waiting there's the 509 truck go <laughs> but dude those are the diehards those are the yeah. diehards That's... those are the guys that keep the industry alive yeah they do um and that was me that still is me really that's why you're so good at it dude shout out yeah, to except... all shout out to all of the like like north dakota like midwest-esque like pushing that way that is the heart of snowmobiling hands down yeah. yep those are my people. Dude, I it's crazy. I go to like this is what's funny. As I go to places like um like Heydays, like a bunch of people know me. Obviously, I'm in, in the industry, which is awesome. Like, um, if I go to like Alpine, Wyoming, a lot of people know me, like these sledding hubs, a lot of people know me. I go to Bend, where I live, nobody knows me. Like <laughs> it's crazy. There's just like no I'm like the lone sledder here. Like yeah. In the like industry wise, you know, there's snowmobilers here, but it's really funny. And you know, it's funny. Actually, like a couple guys like yelled at me the other day, and it totally caught me off guard. I was like, like you thought you were like somebody was stoked to see you, or no, they were stoked to see me, but I thought the oh. opposite. I thought I was getting yelled at. Oh, <laughs> like I'm like, oh, <laughs> dude, what the hell's going on? Because I'm just, which is so wild, you know, because. But it's so cool. Like, it just shows where the industry is and how powerful, like, the force in numbers in the Midwest is ridiculous. Yeah. Midwest, East Coast, you guys hold it down. You're the guys yeah. that keep the industry alive and let us do what we do every single day and keep keep watching it and keep buying the stuff, keep pumping it up because you guys are the heart of it and we yeah. love it. Yeah really is it's uh yeah you know it's interesting how mountain riding is so popular and but the majority of the industry isn't necessarily in mountainous you know area oh not at all so it's, it's like a sliver yeah it's crazy when this like whole intersection of like gear and sleds everything's different right to like properly go ride like if you want to go have fun on the trails you're not riding a mountain sled and you're not wearing mountain gear vice versa right. right um it's kind of interesting there's not a lot of sports that are like that um well for some quick little fun facts yeah um, hit me go so like washington state where i am yeah is nineteen thousand registered snowmobiles now that's just registered granted you know everybody has some lane in their yard or something hasn't been registered for 20 years but uh wisconsin is like three hundred and twenty-five thousand registered snowmobiles <laughs> And Minnesota is like 295,000. And now those numbers are way less than what they actually are. Because if you've ever driven around Minnesota or Wisconsin, everybody and their brother has a sled lane in their backyard somewhere, whether it's a 1970s skidoo or some, you know, something, everybody has a snowmobile. So the industry thrives in the Midwest and the East coast. That's where it is. But it's not necessarily as cool to see a photo of a guy riding a, a trail, you know, sitting down and railing a corner as it is to see a guy, you know, over the hood powder in the West. So the sales are in the Midwest and East coast, but the visuals everybody wants to see are from the West. Yeah. And me growing up there, I completely understand that because we all wanted to ride that. Like every single guy, in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, wants to ride the mountains, wants to experience snow like that and views like that. So we live vicariously through it, you know, watching the films, following the athletes. But uh, the reality is those are the guys that are consuming all the stuff and keeping it alive. Yeah. Dude, shout out to those We just guys. overlook it. Yeah, we overlook yeah, we it all the time. Yeah. I, want... I hate, I mean, I hate to say it, but I don't think about it that often. Yeah. I get. And I want to get back it. and 
Yeah. Yeah. I want to get back and shoot something back there again. Cause I think like, man, people aren't going to want to watch this. Like you guys just want to see stuff in the mountains, but then we've done a few trail things and everybody loves it. Cause they just appreciate giving back to their area and, and featuring, you know, what they do. And I don't want to say they like myself. I mean, that's where I came from. So I totally understand it. Yeah. Dude, that's why the passion burns so bright in David McKinney, 509, feeling your passion. A guy that lives by mm-hmm. the brand he works for. What a legend. Um, mm-hmm. But <laughs> what I was going to say on that is um, I would I would honestly like to go, like, rip. I would love to go ride that new Lynx down. Oh, my God. It, it's I actually rode it, and it was sick on the trail. It, it's a ripper. But I would love to go ride it on, like, proper trails and, like, see what it's all about. Here's the problem. And I get a ton of messages. Guys like, when are you going to come back and ride it? I only have four to five months a year in the snow. Like, so our time's limited, right? And that's the bummer part is like, I can't burn a week going back there when I can, when I got to go, you know, ride the mountains here for like a week. Here's unless what it's I like an epic trip. Like, unless we really plan yeah. it and we really put budget and everything behind it and like, get all our ducks in a row. We can't half-ass it. But if we're going to do it, I'm in. Dude, what I have sitting in the back of my brain at all times is I grew up riding the UP of Michigan, yeah. Houghton area, all that stuff. Loved it. There was a couple winters that were just colossal winters there where it was actually pretty good. Granted, I sucked at backcountry, backcountry snowmobiling at the time. So I was getting stuck everywhere. But I watch the weather there every year. And if there's like a colossal winter there where there's like eight plus feet on the ground in the woods there, I would love to go back now Mm -hmm. with you or somebody like that because the horsepower, the train's not much to ride home about, but if there's eight to 10 feet there, that whole area would be a totally different landscape than what I ever looked at it as. And you could have some serious fun there. It's just like, it's always like two to three feet below where you need it to be like super rowdy and have a good time. Yeah. And they're due. They've had winters like that, just insane record winters and it'll happen eventually. I just hope it happens in, you know, my time frame of filming and shooting stuff. Cause I would in a heartbeat go back there and take like a 146, something like that and just do a million hop overs and yeah, have yeah. all the horsepower. Just dude. Horsepower so, mate horsepower makes up for lack of terrain. I I agree with that. That's a that's yeah. a fact. When you have a lot of horsepower and a little shorter track, oh my god. Yeah. It's so dang fun. Um cuz you know, we just get eaten alive with the power here in the in the high yeah. mountains. So, that's why we all ride boost. We all like to ride boost, mm-hmm. so. Mm-hmm. Maybe you'll see me on a boosted links. I don't know. Let's see. You're so. definitely going to see me at a boosted Polaris because that's my thing. And you're definitely going to see Ross at a Lynx because that's his thing. And we don't have any choice either way. And guess what? We still love each other and we're all happy yeah. and we're friends. Yeah. 100%. I don't know what this thing that's- is. My, I don't have many more thoughts, but I do have this thought and it circulates my head is how kind of like separated the industry is sometimes from like what brand you ride. I'm like, dude, who cares? It's yeah. like, it's like the worst, it's worse than any other sport I've ever seen. It's like, 100%, yeah. you have, dude, like Ken Roxon trains with Adam Cianciolo. They ride for factory Honda and factory Kawasaki, but you yeah. never, you rarely see any riders that ride like Caleb and Kyle are the two best examples. They ride cat and players and they ride together all the time. That's amazing. We need more of that. I think in the sport, the whole, like ditch thing is annoying to me dude like it just yeah go <laughs> i think i have the answer i think i have the answer sorry okay go fine. i've thought about this also and here's my theory it's the only sport really where you can get stuck mm. you can't really get stuck on a dirt bike mountain bike utv on sleds you can get stuck and no matter how big of a pile of shit your buddy is, it's the sled's <laughs> it's the sled's fault. It's the sled's fault. And if it's a Polaris Skidoo, Articat Lynx, whatever it is, if your buddy's consistently getting stuck, it's because of the sled. 
And I feel that plays a huge role in it. Yep. It doesn't matter. It- And this is the problem with a lot of the people, too, because it doesn't matter that you weigh 475 pounds, Frank, and you didn't work out this winter to get ready for snowmobiling, billing and you haven't worked on your technique at all. It's Mm -hmm. the sled's fault that you got stuck. But then, but then miraculously, you throw you could throw any of the top riders on these sleds and go have them go to battle and things are going to get interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every sled has its. Every sled has its strength and weakness. That's true. But the same goes for everything, every other industry. So it's like, yeah, mm-hmm. we got to quit doing that. Be nice to your friends. Tell them to get in the gym. Don't blame it on their soul bill. Tell them to mm-hmm. work on their technique, get in the gym, get their act together so they don't get stuck. Because it doesn't matter yeah. what they're going to buy. They're still going to get stuck because they ate 14 <laughs> cheeseburgers and drank 47 beers the night before. Oh, I'll do that still, though. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> Come on. Come on. I'm just, a, well, I'm just a filmer. Yeah. You're more than a filmer. You're a friend, David. Thanks, Ross. Appreciate it. <laughs> well, man, I could keep rambling with you, but I feel like we should save it for a episode later in the season. We'll save it for another date. Okay. Um, I'm I also just... so such a good friend with you that I'm 100% confident and have no issue ending your podcast for you. Yeah, end my podcast. You're out. He's done. Yeah, yeah. I'm also um, very hungry right now. Yeah. Well, it is. It's nine o'clock. I appreciate you being. Uh, I pushed it back because I ate pizza with my mother, and you know, I got got to hang out with mom. So appreciate you being on here. Episode, no, technically episode number two, but this is episode number one of a guest with your boy, David McKinney. Um, where can where can the people follow you? I'm just doing what everybody else does. Oh, are we doing like uh, hot ones? <laughs> no, or yeah, it's like where where can where can where can the audience connect with you? Uh, you can follow me on the Instagrams at DMC Digital. That's D as in David, M as in McKinney, C as in C <laughs> Digital, and uh, obviously five hundred nine uh, Instagram. Post a lot of stuff on there, and then if you add me on Facebook, I'm probably not going to accept it because I never check that. But thanks also, for being the main honest. thing. Yeah, the main thing is check out the 519 YouTube channel. We got an awesome 10 episodes from last winter and then the three-part series of Ross and I. Uh, They're all up there active live now. Check them out. Leave a comment. Subscribe. Like them. We're going to keep pumping out more. Just the beginning of this series, and we're going to head into winter 22 with season two of it with another 10-plus episodes coming your way. So You're a beast. Thanks for being Thank here, you, bro. Ross. And and go you, go watch the Moto series. David and I need you guys to watch that. We need to we need you to gas those numbers up for us. Leave a comment and stuff so we can do it again next year, bigger and better. Um. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. Anyways, thanks for being here, bro. And uh, appreciate it, Ross. We'll do it again soon. Sounds good, buddy. That's all I have. I don't know how to end okay. these things. All right. I don't know what to do with my here, hands. Here, I'll end it for you. I'm leaving. Okay. Now, okay. Okay. Bye. bye.